iPhones get hacked, RSA distances itself from an allegedly NSA-backdoored crypto algorithm, and a rally against mass surveillance is brewing in Washington. All that and more this time on ThreatWire. Hello, welcome to ThreatWire. I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. This is your summary of what's threatening security, privacy, and internet freedom. And we're starting off with change. Change is nigh. Change is good, right? Well, yeah, in this case, despite right. the NSA's best attempts to pollute the internet and erode the trust of once great nation, we're actually seeing positive change on both the political and technological fronts. See, yeah, you know, if you see something, say something. And yes. that's what our boy Edward Snowden did. And thanks to his whistleblowing in the New York Times, as well as other journalists, were able to uncover what could be described as a plot to undermine the fundamental securities of the internet. You know, the uh, the recently outed NSA bull run program that seeks to insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems, networks, and endpoint communications devices, as well as influence policies, standards, and specifications for commercial public key technologies. Whew. That's right, the standard in question here, the dual ECDRBG. Okay, the what? that's the last time I'm gonna say it that way. <laughs> it's it's a pseudo-random number generator that's used in most crypto systems. And it was, uh, you know, it's essential for the integrity of really any crypto system. Back in 2004, RSA started using it. Those guys are a huge name mm -hmm. in security. You guys know them from their key fobs, the secure ID and things of that nature. Well, it was later introduced as a standard by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, right, in 2006. And at the time of its introduction, actually some cryptographers pointed out that there were some inherent weaknesses with the design. There's even a 2007 article by Bruce Schneier in Wired Magazine talking, you know, the title was, did NSA put a secret backdoor in new encryption standard? Well, <laughs> based on the recent New York Times assertion, the answer to that might be yes, but that didn't stop it from being widely used. No, dual EC was even adopted by ISO, the International Organization for Standards, but this isn't just about standards by dudes, okay? This actually has real world implications because if the NSA backdoor dual EC, then all bets are off. So who's using it? Well, none other than RSA, Cisco, Juniper, Blackberry, OpenSSL, McAfee, Microsoft, Samsung, Symantec, and GE Healthcare, to name a few. The list is pretty astounding. It's not the default random number generator used by them all. However, just by having it available to the NSA, if it is broken, it creates an attack vector. Mm -hmm. You know, Microsoft made its implementation in Vista and has since kept the algorithm around, most recently as part of Windows 8 RT Server 2012. Well, you get the idea. So, in response to these leaks, subsequent, you know, the subsequent mainstream awareness of this bad crypto mojo, NIST reopened the special special the special publications for comment <laughs> and review and you know here's where it gets awesome. RSA, the very ones that you know introduced this and started using dual EC in 2004, released an advisory to customers telling them stop using an alg algorithm. That's another fun word. Wow. So regardless of whether the pseudorandom number generator is actually backdoored or simply just bad code, the silver lining here is that after almost a decade, it's getting the proper review, you know? Unlike terrorist attacks, which result in the loss of freedom, we're actually seeing advances in technology as a response to Snowden leaks. I love that. I don't know about you guys, I think that's a win. I think that's a huge win. I'm yeah. jazzed about that. That's insane. Now, something that's, well, kind of a win for the CCC, the famous German hacking group called the Chaos Computer Club has claimed to have hacked the fingerprint scanner on the new iPhone, which is called Touch ID. So to do so, they took a photo of the user's fingerprint from a glass surface. So first off, the fingerprint is photographed mm -hmm. at 2400 DPI. It has a very high resolution. It's inverted and then laser printed at 1200 DPI onto a transparent sheet with really really thick toner so that the ink comes out you can feel oh, it. Oh that's fantastic. Yeah. So pink latex milk or a white wood glue is smeared on the printed pattern and then once it's dry the latex is lifted off it's breathed onto so that it creates you know normal moisture like mm -hmm. your finger does yep. and then it's used on the phone. <laughs> that's awesome. Now they found a little bit of a discrepancy here so they also did a second version of the hack that was used by a CCC member called Starbug by photographing the fingerprint at 2400 dpi again printing the inverted image to transfer transparent paper, 1200 dpi again. They used a PCB material, which is used to make the mold of the fingerprint. A graphite spray is applied to improve the capacitive touch response mm -hmm. whenever you click it onto the iPhone. And then they used white wood glue smeared onto the mold and then pried off and used on the phone. 
that is just wicked. I love this. See, <laughs> I didn't hilarious. say, didn't I just say last week this is going to usher in oh, new yeah. awesome, you know, fingerprint hacking. You so, knew it would. Way to go, CCC. So, the Chaos Computer Club stands by the fact that you cannot change your fingerprint, though the iPhone does give you the option to use up to five different prints, which I found out just a couple of days ago. And it may be easier for agencies to actually use your biometrics against you in a court of law. Mm -hmm. Now, is touchidhackedyet.com verifies that Starbug is the first to document the hack, and as such, he will win over $10,000 in prizes Yay. from volunteer donors, <laughs> some of which we are friends with. That's awesome now, stuff. Now, Starbug is giving all of the money to, I'm going to let you say this word because I don't know how to say it, Romfartgentur? Gentur? Yeah. Our, our, our friends are going to hate us for that. Thank you. It's, it's a spin-off of CCC Berlin. So with all of that said and done, it is still useful to use Touch ID for consumers that find a pin code we're really too time consuming, which happens more than 50% of the world is doing. Ah, uh, convenience yeah, and security. Yeah, convenience. So having some sort of security is, all in all, better than none. But in the case of iOS 7, it seems that any security can still be circumvented. So the first hack bypasses the lock screen by giving the person permission to the camera album. By swiping up from the pin code screen, clicking into the timer app, and then holding down the power button, pressing cancel, and double clicking the home button, I did this myself, I know it works, a user can get into the camera album and then share photos out to other applications and social networks. You could even do something such as emailing yourself and deleting the picture and then sending out well, whatever kind of emails you want to from their actual phone. Now, an Apple spokesperson said that the company takes security very seriously and that it's aware of the issue. We'll deliver a fix in a future software update, but for now you can disable the control center feature so that your phone isn't actually hacked. Hooray. Now, the second hack is to make actual calls. It takes a little bit more patience. You swipe to the emergency calling screen, type in a phone number, and then press the call button multiple times. And you have to do this for like one or two minutes until it actually works. Eventually, the Apple logo appears and the call is made. Woo! Now, Apple is planning a fix for this one as well in the next round of updates. Hooray. Yeah. So I was able to recreate both of these hacks on my iPhone 5 with iOS 7 with no problems at all. So in the meantime, I'm probably just going to put my iPhone in a safe and use my Nexus 4. <laughs> <laughs> Are you using a four-digit pen on your Nexus 4? Yes. Use a five-digit pen. I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just got a call recently from like a, a state trooper in Kentucky that needed some help with a rubber ducky brute forcing an Android phone, and I'm like, Dude, I love this kind of stuff. That's awesome. Uh, double edge, man, let me tell you. Okay, <laughs> last week we got a comment uh, and the, it, our question was, you know, how can you trust the NSA? Have, mm -hmm. have they lost your trust? Can they get it back? And if so, you know, how would you feel about the NSA being reformed? And our comment of the week comes from Malkut who writes, how can I trust the NSA? They spend billions of taxpayer dollars on programs that anyone else would be arrested for if their only defense is, you know, we have good intentions. Trust us. My first inclination is to never trust anyone who says trust me without <laughs> being able to back it up. And to that, the fact that I'm not a U.S. citizen and therefore subhuman according to their worldview, I think I'm just justified in saying that I never trusted the NSA. Yeah. yeah, it's really easy as an American point. to like get caught up in some of the stuff without thinking about the fact that we're telling the rest of the world watching you. Mm -hmm. That's creepy. So this week we would like to know how far you're willing to go to protect your privacy, seeing that security is inherently at odds with convenience, and given our culture of convenience, commercialism, and immediacy, how much of an inconvenience are you personally willing to tolerate? Let us know in the comments. And also remember you can find all of the ways to subscribe at threatwire.org. Always get this show delivered to you and get involved at our Google Plus community for discussion on, on stories just like these. Joshua shared a group of European and U.S. researchers developed a hardware trojan that can be added to circuitry during manufacturing. The trojan can be added to a processor to bypass cryptographic techniques. Now, the fully documented paper described how to use the trojan on an Ivy Bridge processor, which pretty much everybody has. Dude, this is wicked <laughs> stuff. I love this. Now, a rally against the mass surveillance will take place in Washington, D.C. on October 26th. Over you a half million. I, I really hope. We'll see. We'll oh, see. Man. Really want to be there. Over a half million citizens have petitioned against the NSA surveillance, and this will be the largest rally yet in defense of our privacy. So if you want to attend, sign up at rally.stopwatching.us. .us, which is ironic and Stop awesome. Stop watching, US. US. Yeah. 
<laughs> With all that, I'm Shannon Morris. I'm Darren Kitchen. We'll see you on the internet. Bye-bye. Which must remain free! Remain